So relocalizing food systems is one major proposal that is made. The second one that emerges from this movement is to rebalance power relationships in the food chains and more generally to make the food systems more hospitable to small-scale farmers. Today, we have an increasingly globalized food system dominated by very large agri-food corporations and smallholders in many cases have a very limited buyers whom they can sell to. And they find themselves in a very unequal bargaining position in respect to the price they can capture for the crops that they produce. In fact, the sourcing and pricing policies of commodity buyers, in part, explain why smallholders in developing countries today are the single most important group that is suffering from hunger. States have a number of tools that they could use to strengthen the position of smallholders and allow them to reap a greater proportion of the food dollar that is paid by the consumer at the other end of the chain. They could, for example, support the establishment of farmers cooperatives through appropriate legal frameworks, capacity building programs, or tax incentives, enhancing thus the capacity for smallholders to organize themselves in order to obtain higher prices when they sell their produce. These cooperatives could allow smallholders to achieve certain economies of scale, to set up storage facilities, to market their produce, to package their produce, instead of depending on the middlemen or on corporations. Cooperatives can help farmers to implement the increasingly complex norms and standards that buyers impose, and um, they can encourage um, um, a dialogue with public authorities, giving these farmers a voice. States could also act against the unfair practices of buyers, large agri-food corporations in the system. Excessive concentration in the food chain can be challenged, for example, by national competition regimes. Today, these competition regimes are not suited, really, to protect smallholders in the food chains. Essentially, these competition regimes are designed to protect the consumer from high prices that are the result of unfair commercial practices by dominant sellers in the food system. They are not designed to protect producers from the abuse of dominant power by the buyers. States where suppliers are based, however, could extend the reach of their competition law in order to challenge the abuses by the buyers of their dominant position in the system. And this is done, for example, again in South Africa. In South Africa, there is a competition act from 1999 that states that the aims of competition law should be to provide employment and advance the social and economic welfare of South Africans, to ensure that small and medium-sized enterprises have an equitable opportunity to participate in the economy, and to promote a greater spread of ownership, in particular, says this Competition Act, to uh, increase the ownership stakes of historically disadvantaged uh, persons. Consistent with these objectives, the Competition Com Commission in South Africa has launched investigations into the practices of milk processors who were um, fixing the purchase price of milk at the expense of small dairy farmers, and they have investigated into the practices of the supermarket industry, um, citing as a concern the exclusion of smallholders from the retail shelves as a result of buyer power concentration. So I've listed a number of tools that could be used to rebalance power in the food chains and the food systems. However, I believe that all these tools will have a limited impact unless they are made part of a much more fundamental change in the food systems. Indeed, the relationships between producers and buyers are deeply unequal and they shall remain so unless farmers have many more outlets to which to sell, many more channels to which to have access to markets, and unless their capacity to negotiate better deals is significantly improved. And this is one more reason to invest in local food systems and in public procurement schemes that support local small-scale producers. The more farmers are given real choices, the stronger their position will be in negotiating prices and other conditions set by the buyers. 
This is what the right to food is about. It is not simply a matter of boosting supply to meet growing needs. It is about who produces, for whom, at which conditions. It is about reducing the gap between the farm gate prices and retail prices to ensure access to affordable food. It is also about empowering the most marginal food producers and allowing them to capture a greater portion of the value of their produce. And it is about allowing the vast number of small-scale farmers in developing countries to reach, finally, their full potential. The movement for alternative food systems also propose, proposes, thirdly, to support agroecological practices that make the most efficient use of natural resources and that reduce the dependence of food production on fossil energies. Agroecology is simply a way to apply ecological science to the design of agricultural systems. It enhances the productivity of soils and protects the crops against pests by relying on the natural environment, by using beneficial trees, plants, animals, and insects, as described today by Robin Board and Miguel Altieri. We know that agroecology considerably reduces the reliance of farmers on chemical fertilizers and pesticides, making farming more affordable to them and making farming less vulnerable to the price variations of fossil energies and these very increasingly expensive external inputs. Agroecological techniques are now relied upon in many developed and developing countries with impressive results in comparison to the conventional chemical-based approach. In fact, one famous study by Jules Pretty from the University of Sussex, although there are discussions as to um, how he chose his sample, but that study showed an average crop yield increase of 80% over 57 developing countries where sustainable farming practices were monitored and the increase was 116% on the African projects. And more recently, it has been shown with a study uh, looking at 20 African countries that crop yields actually doubled in a period of three to 10 years as a result of sound, sustainable farming techniques. Conventional farming, in contrast, is expensive because of its dependence on oil and gas. It accelerates climate change. It often depletes the soil instead of stimulating the biotic activity of the soil. And it is not resilient to climate shocks. It simply is not, today, the best choice anymore. In fact, even Malawi, the country that is boasted for its massive chemical fertilizer subsidy program a few years ago, is now implementing agroecology. The government is subsidizing farmers so that they plant nitrogen-fixing trees in their fields in order to ensure sustained growth of maize production. The program today benefits some 1.3 million of the poorest farmers, and the yield increases um, are significant, moving from one, a bit more than one ton per hectare to two, three tons per hectare by such um, practices of agroforestry. In sum, agroecology replaces pesticides and chemical fertilizers with knowledge of sound practices that reduce dependency on external inputs. It is therefore knowledge intensive, and it requires public policies supporting agricultural research and participatory extension services. Farmer-to-farm -farm exchanges of practices are done on a significant scale in Central America and Cuba, as documented uh, by Eric Hall Jimenez in particular. Participatory plant breeding also can be encouraged. Farmer field schools can be one way to promote this horizontal exchange of knowledge. All this can contribute to the diffusion of agroecological practices. For this very reason, because it is knowledge intensive, agroecology cannot be separated from its social dimension. It is empowering. It is empowering because it puts farmers in the driving seat. It calls for forms of social organization that gives farmers a voice. They were being taught in a top-down fashion, where science was produced in laboratories. They are now teaching themselves with the science that is best suited to the local environment in which they operate. 
they were ignored except as clients of input providers and as providers of cheap commodities. They now have a voice. They are active participants in shaping research and in identifying solutions that suit them best. A fourth proposition of this movement for alternative food systems is that we need to reclaim control over the food systems. From the local municipal level to the global level, and at the national and sub-national levels of government, a demand for democracy and control over the food systems is being expressed. The basic claim is that citizens must regain control over food systems and food chains that have been increasingly corporate driven and shaped under the pressure of international markets and the exigencies of export-led agriculture. The current reclaiming of the food systems takes a number of forms. And let me provide four illustrations. First, at local level, citizens increasingly unite in order to better understand the food systems that serve them, focusing especially on the food dependencies and the risks involved in such dependencies, and on the links between the supply of food and nutrition, and they seek to reform the systems towards improved sustainability. Food policy councils are one major illustration of this, and the slow food movement is another. Second, at the national level, participatory fora are being established. Often, these fora are linked to the highest levels of government, and they allow for a permanent dialogue between government and civil society organizations and farmers' organizations. The mechanisms through which this participation of civil society and farmers' organizations are ensured are varied. In Brazil, for example, um, they have established CONSEA, the National Council for Food Security and, and Nutrition, in which two, two thirds of the members are civil society representatives, one third are the delegates of the ministers. And this allows for participatory development of food strategies. Third, certain fora may favor a chain-wide learning process about the food system from the farmer to the consumer, allowing governments to identify blockages in the system and to improve the sustainability of food systems as a whole. For example, during this mission I did in July in South Africa, I was very interested to see that the South African Human Rights Commission intended to deepen the work launched by the Southern African Food Security Change Lab. Now, the Southern African, or South African Food Security Change Lab links the various actors of the food chain in search of innovative solutions that can improve the sustainability of the food systems. This means that actors in the food chains are linked not only by the prices, not only by solutions that follow the blind workings of the market, they look for solutions that will ensure that each actor is sufficiently empowered and that the system as a whole is sufficiently sustained. Fourth example, finally, in global governance. The monopoly of governmental delegates and the reign of the segmentation of policy areas is coming to an end. And there too, demands for participation and inclusiveness in the shaping of food policies are being heard. Indeed, one of the most significant results of the food price crisis of 2008 was the reform of the Rome-based Committee on World Food Security, an inclusive forum in which governments and international organizations work together with civil society organizations and farmers' organizations and the private sector in order to identify ways to combat hunger and malnutrition. Now, the Committee on World Food Security has, of course, no formal decision-making power, but at the same time, it is highly legitimate because of the collective will that it expresses, and its conclusions for this reason would be very difficult for governments to ignore. What we are seeing with the CFS is a new breed of global governance in which NGOs, farmers' organizations, are co-authors of the international law with governments and international agencies. What we are seeing, in fact, is the democratization of decision-making at the global level. These then are the, the four pillars of this emerging alternative future.
for the food systems. They are the rebuilding of local food systems, meeting the demand of local small food producers and the urban consumers, the strengthening of small-scale farmers in the food chains and the food systems generally, to ensure that these systems are more equitable and inclusive, the shift towards ways of producing food that are more resource efficient and supported by adequate forms of social organization of farmers, and fourthly, the requirement of democracy and control at all levels of the food systems. And has this alternative been influential? Has it influenced the reform of the food systems that is underway? Well, superficially, it seems that the visionaries who put forward the views I've described are now at last being heard, in part, at least. International declarations all refer to the need to support smallholders, both because it is acknowledged that their levels of productivity remain much lower than they could achieve if they were appropriately supported, and also because governments have finally come to see we will only achieve sustainable success in combating hunger by reducing rural poverty, their poverty, the poverty of these farmers. All international declarations refer to some version of sustainable or climate smart agriculture and to the need to reduce the ecological footprint of food production, although I still have to see one international declaration referring to the ecological hoofprint described by Tony Weiss. And increasingly, these international declarations refer to the nutrition dimension as one dimension of the food crisis that has been, us that has been underestimated and that must be put back on the international agenda. In some respects, at least, it seems as though the visionaries of yesterday have become the mainstream. Yet, these advances remain for the moment largely purely rhetorical. First, there is a considerable misalignment between the facts on the ground, the new consensus that is emerging from international conferences. While the potential of small-scale agriculture is widely recognized, it is still the small farmers who are facing the threat of being priced out from land markets or simply from being expelled from the land that they cultivate. And while there is now a shared understanding on the important role of agrobiodiversity for future food security, monocropping schemes are increasing in all regions. The incentives are not aligned with the proclaimed intentions. Second, there is a gap between what governments are recommended to do to address food insecurity and the direction of agricultural development that is shaped largely not by them, but by private investment and by the policies of agri-food companies. To a large extent, buyers in the global food chains source from large or mid-sized farmers because the transaction costs involved in working with large numbers of small farmers are very high and because of the difficulties of small farmers to meet with the, compli the, the com compliance requirements with the private standards set by these large buyers. And to a large extent, private investment in agriculture is a code word for investment in large-scale plantations rather than in small-scale family farming. As a result, small-scale farmers are left to depend for their support on public programs or local markets, but the programs are underfinanced and the local markets are underdeveloped. Third, there is a striking fragmentation of governments in two ways. First, what is done or should be done at the local level is not supported by national or international policy environments. And secondly, within each level of government, a segmented sectorialized approach dominates when the reform of the food systems would require much more coordination across different policy areas. At global level, for example, governments are told that the priority should be for them to regain their ability to feed themselves, but the trade agenda pressures them instead to further liberalize the agricultural sector and both to further develop export-led agriculture and to continue to depend on international markets to feed their populations. 